Oh, hi there. This is the last stop of my tour, and we saved it for last because you're the sickest people in the country. <laughs> we did quantitative and qualitative research to identify pockets of mental illness in the country. No, we didn't really do that. We didn't really do that. Um, people ask me, though, it's weird, this question again and again, what do you think normal is? And I think normal is secretly broken in places we don't like to talk about or that we hope we can get over someday or that we'll just cobble along anyway, you know? There's not like a normal. There's different degrees of things that people have that hubcaps that are falling off and dents here and there. And this is a book that I wrote to help people who are um, sort of psychologically ambitious and who want to fix themselves, get over stuff. I've gotten a lot of stuff in my life to get over and I, I'm good at it. When I was a kid, some of you may know from running with scissors, I didn't, I didn't have parents. My mother was mentally ill, my father was uh, alcoholic and probably a sociopath as well. And they gave me away to their psychiatrist when I was a little boy, when I was 12, and he was insane. So it was, <laughs> there was no adult in my life I could ever go to when I had an issue. And I didn't go to school past the fourth grade. So there was no authority figure. And when I had a problem or something was bothering me or I was upset or whatever it was, I had to figure it out myself. You know, I had to sort of build a mouse trap every single time. And some of them actually work really well. Some of them work better. So this book covers a lot of different things. And some of them I don't even have experience with, but the the reason those chapters work as well is because the point is really the same, but it's tricky. It's about learning how to be really truthful about your own life to yourself, you know, because the truth, even you can be a very honest person and yet not actually be living truthfully because the thing you think is true or assume is true or have been told is true or have lived the umbrella of truth under which you have lived your whole life may not actually be the actual true thing. So I'm gonna read a tiny little excerpt to show you an example. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really butcher, I'm gonna talk and read it, okay? Cause it's, um, it's too long and cumbersome. So this, is a, this piece is about, I started going over and doing different, different subjects as I've been on tour. So this is Nashville, I'm gonna do dreams. And this is like how to let go of it or not, you know? The, um, the chapter begins with my own annoyance at like watching the Grammys or the Oscars or something and you know, someone wins and they stand up there and they say, this is to you out there watching. You know, if you've got a dream, don't ever give it up. You'll be like me, I'm proof. And you watch that and you just feel goosebumps and you think, yeah. And I just wanna say, have you heard the covers on YouTube that people are doing? Don't tell them that. <laughs> Some of these people need to have their little dreams wrenched from their hands. <laughs> and we all admire people. It's like almost a cliche of never giving up your dream. But that's actually really bad advice. <laughs> and I'm a perfect example of why. Oh, this was horrible. So. The beginning of this is about, I, 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 I have this knowledge in me as a uh, 13. I am amazing as an actor, possibly the best, okay? But I'm, I'm a raw diamond. I've got to go, I've got to be, you know, I need some training, so I take a theater course. And to my annoyance, we have to learn a monologue from a play. So I not only have to, I have to like read a play, and it would be many years before I ever read a book at this point. I could read, I just didn't. But I had to memorize it. So I went to the library, plays, and I looked for like the skinniest ones, and I would open the skinny ones up, and I would look for, this is how I did it, man's name, big block of text. Put it back, and finally I found one, right? So I'm in this class, and we're getting videotaped. This is back in the old Betamax days. It felt like a physical touch, a thumb firmly but gently pressing along the path of my sternum. Certainty is what it was. 
I just knew, you know? My certainty was that thumb pressing my chest. As I stood in front of the other students in the acting class in Amherst, Massachusetts in 1981, and while they watched me, I looked over their seated heads at the wall, yet in a way watched myself, and by watched myself, I mean I really saw myself. I may have had just the slightest British accent in my voice because I loved movies from the 40s, especially the way the actors said our ordinary American words. And here's my little monologue. Half as big as life. That's me, I said. And as I said it, it was as if my eyes were two windows facing a gray, endless pelt of rain. Half as big as life. That's small. But deep in my heart, I can feel that I'm 10 feet tall, 10 feet tall. That rhyme, along with several others throughout the monologue, had annoyed me initially because there was something so cute, cloyingly cute about rhyming, not my thing. It seemed chirpy, but I ignored this concern and memorized it anyway because this was easier than selecting another play, one that didn't have rhyming dialogue. I told myself, this is an incredible opportunity to take this dusty, forgotten play yanked from its grave of a bookshelf and make it amazing. That would be a real accomplishment. So now I love the idea that I'd pick this dud of a play with rhyming dialogue. The more I read, of course, the more I loathed the play. And this struck me as right. I had always needed to defy the odds, hadn't I? I had always needed to be the one who finds a diamond ring right there in a mound of dog poo. I would take what was obviously a play written not by a writer but by a happy person who had been given a typewriter for Christmas and I would turn it into a dramatic masterpiece. So as I stood there in front of the other students delivering my monologue with chilling emotional precision, I could actually feel how good I was. <laughs> Goosebumps rose on my arms and surely on the arms of the other students and the teacher as well. I was going to be one of, or possibly the, greatest actor of my day. I had known this since a very young age. I contained within me extra, um, an extra emotional range that I did not see displayed in other people, but that I recognized, but, they, but that they recognized when they saw in me. That's the only way I can describe my certainty that I was born to act, to inhabit other people, because I, my own self, couldn't make connections with others quite so easily. And when I do, did, they were staged. I'd always been acutely self-conscious, as though I spoke a separate, small, little-known language and didn't want to give myself away. What happened next, I'm skipping a little bit, what happened next remains so vivid that even in private, my face flushes. <laughs> the acting teacher looked at me with an expression like, this can't be true, but this is true, right? <laughs> and she asked, you know that's not a monologue, right? I'm curious to know why you chose the lyrics from a song from Promises, Promises, <laughs> which is a musical, as your piece. I mean, it's an interesting concept, maybe, to explore. Why don't you actually sit down and let me play it back for you? Thank the Lord Jesus for making video recorders and playback decks at exactly the right moment in time, because I was now able to see myself, not in my own mind, but rather with my own eyes. <laughs> and it was a stunning revelation. The knowledge that I was giving an incredible performance in no way aligned with the reality of what I saw before me. Except for the nervous twitch of my left eyelid, the motionless figure on the screen appeared to be a J.C. Penney mannequin with chips. <laughs> At first, I actually thought something might be wrong with the VCR player. <laughs> but I thought this only for the briefest moment. Skip, skip, skip ahead. And um, so I realized that I talk here about like, Okay, if you screw up a cake, you know, you can run to the store speedy quick and buy like an extra can of frosting if it like sinks in the middle and you can fill it with frosting and no one will really know in, until they get the middle piece. Then it's like that razor burn on your tongue of sugar. 
But at first, the first impression, the primacy effect, it'll be fine. But you cannot do this if the cake has baked itself out of the pan and gone missing. <laughs> Nothing does not get better with hard work and dedication. I was not an actor. And I realized I was a writer. And there's just a couple things here that I want to talk about. Um, so how do you actually know if you should give up your dream? I'm going to go over here and get water for a second. We have things hidden all over. Water, puppies, <laughs> kittens. The problem with you no know, like dreams and should you give it up or not is that no one can tell you. You may, let's say you want to be a singer, okay? Let's say you want to be a singer and the oh, and you and but you're like at home. You're like a teenager at home with your miserable parents. And the only time they've ever heard you sing is when you be when you just like happy birthday to you and they're like you can't be a singer. You know, you totally can't be but only you know what you actually contain. Only you have access to the full list of ingredients. And that makes it tricky. That makes it tricky because you can't ask somebody. So what I have found is that if you can imagine, if you can imagine a different life for yourself, that might be a sign that you should give up your dream. If you can imagine being a vet tech, you know, or a dancer, you know, or whatever it is, if you can imagine yourself doing something else, possibly that's one clue. If there is no separation between your life and the thing it is that you dream of doing, if there is, you can't see the seam, if there's an invisible seam, and you have real difficulty with even the concept of separating a dream from life, that might be a sign that you should hold on to your dream and never let it go. And the good thing about that is that if you don't make it, if you don't see your dream, there's like a door prize. You're the person that actually went after their dream and did it, you know? So that's one of the, the sort of more, more uh, optimistic truths in the book. But much of the book is, um, is not especially funny. And I actually added things to that chapter as I spoke to see if I could make it a little funnier. Because it's not a book you read out loud. It's really a book that you read and absorb what applies to you. One of the things that I talk about, that I've tried to talk about everywhere I've been, is suicide. Because I was actually going to kill myself when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. I did not see any hope or any future for myself. I was miserable, lonely, isolated, confused. I was grossed out. I was just violated in every way. And it seemed like even if I did make it to, you know, the age of 18, I was never, I was, I had, I was so removed from society. What would I even do? I wanted peace, relief, and escape. So I studied methods and I picked mine. And I rehearsed it, and I, then I rehearsed it in my mind. I was going to slip my wrists in a bathtub. Now, I'm visual, so even though I'm a writer, write, words are not my first language. Pictures, and then I write down what I see. So I was able to see myself in the tub with the ribbons of red swirling into the water. And I was able to visualize it in such a real way that I could just viscerally imagine and, and know what it was going to be like. And it was, there was not relief. It was shocking because it was so new. And then my heart would beat, and that would make more of the blood come. It, so I realized that this, the act of suicide doesn't provide the relief or release because all it can do is add a layer of horror or anxiety or whatever that depends on your method. If it did provide relief, everyone would rise up immediately and stop the suicide in progress because the human drive to live is extraordinarily powerful. It's very difficult to kill yourself. If you want to hang yourself, you've got to do it. 
where you can't save yourself at the last minute because even if you don't want to save yourself at the last minute, your body does and it will. That's how I know that cutting my wrists is not gonna give me any relief. So in addition to all the awful negative, tiny, 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 narrow life feelings that I was experiencing, it's gonna be now frosted with this horror and regret. So that got me thinking. Plus there was another problem with it. Once the shock of it, of my method was over, there would be no relief because there would be no neurological activity. There would be no peace because my brain would not be working anymore. So I would never get that benefit. And this is awful to admit, but I would also not get the benefit of enjoying the suffering of those around me. So this is the kind of truth I'm talking about having to train yourself to see in your life with your problems. I saw that what I want isn't really to kill myself, but to end my life. And there's a huge difference. And when your life is so small and awful and you hate everyone and you hate yourself and you can step out of it, literally, barefoot, walk out the door, turn left if you always turn right, and go. You don't have to say goodbye. You don't have to explain it. You can go. You can go to Goa, India on a container ship. You don't have money? Oh, there are many ways to get money. The thing I saw is that I had been wrong in my assessment of life. Life sucks. But life doesn't actually suck. It's too large. It can. It can. But my life, which was, and as your life, our, each of our lives, it is our world. It is our world. But it's not the world. It's tiny. Tiny, 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 tiny so that when you've run out of options and suicide is the only option for that peace and freedom, know that there's not going to be peace and freedom because there's no neurological activity, know that. And then really ask yourself if it's your body you want to kill or is it that you need a new life? And that can be catastrophic, of course, to the people you leave behind and it's horrible and you know, I mean, but we're talking about death here, death or not death. Another, um, and I'm going to take some questions in one second. I'm just going to, you know how, do you, do you do this down here? Like send you samples in the mail of like laundry detergent? Do you have ever had that happen? I only had it happen to me once in New York City, and it was when I did my own laundry, and it was actually when I was out. It was like, so I'm going to do that now with this. So many people want to be confident, more confident. I wish I were more confident. What is it? You want more of it, what is it? Can you go to the doctor and get your blood confidence level checked? You gotta cut back on those artichokes, son. The thing about confidence, I was reading about how people sort of, what they put in books to get people more confident, and they're like these steps, of confidence and affirmations, reminding yourself of your accomplishments. But that's not confidence. Competence is not confidence. You can be incompetent and have no idea what you're doing and be very confident. <laughs> um, I got into advertising when I was a teenager and I was totally fine presenting to the most horrible corporate board you can imagine. Intimidating. I just was totally fine with it. And people would remark afterward, you're so confident in presentations. So I've always been aware that I'm this, I have this thing, this extra tail people want. So what is it? What do I have? What do, what do I have? What's this thing? And I know exactly what I have. It's, it's not a real thing. There's no such thing. Confidence is something that resides in the observer. Confidence is a word we use to describe a certain quality that we see in a person. 
And it's a quality of being oneself doing what one is doing at the moment one is doing it. Um, back when uh, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone to the world, it didn't work on stage. It didn't work. There was a little glitch. And he made a joke. And everyone loved him and loved the phone for the joke. The reason he made a joke is because he's looking at the phone. It's not doing what it should be doing. <laughs> he knows the phone. He knows it works. But he knows something's glitchy. And he's a guy. It's his company. He's himself, and he's like making, well, da -da -da, makes a funny joke. But imagine if the moment it didn't work, he became aware of how he must look on stage. People are, the world is watching him. The whole world is watching, and he's failing. This is going to drive the stock down. This is going to do this. It's going to do this. It's going to do As soon as your mind exits the thing you're doing, you can bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. I mean, I love people, and I think you probably feel the same way. I, I love someone who makes just a genuine, awful mistake, you know, and they're just completely human about it, than someone who panics when they make it and then try to backpedal and pretend it never happened, you know? We don't like that. Being confident, then, requires not the addition of something, but the subtraction of something. You have to subtract awareness of others. And you can do that. You can like trick yourself to do it a few times. Like once you do it once or twice, you can taste it. It's almost like it must burn new um, chemical neurological pathways in your brain because it's easier the next time. I remember I was talking to some um, at-risk teens and they had military clothing on. And um, I said something to the effect of, does anyone here like have a mortal fear of public speaking, would like to get over it. And this 16-year-old young woman, this girl, stood up and then immediately regretted it. You could say, it's like, oh, well, no, I didn't mean to stand up. But so she was laughing and she came onto the stage and she was like turned over giggling. And I was like, no, no, listen, look at me, look at, look at me, look, 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 look. I was wearing um, glasses, but not these glasses. The glasses I was wearing on this day had lenses that, um, flipped up out of the way. There's like a little hinge right here. And the lenses flip up. They're for like using a microscope or a camera. So I looked at this girl and I said, look at me for a second. Okay, look at these glasses. Look, stop giggling. Look at my eyes. Look, see these? See how the glass flips up? I want you to show these. All you have to do is show these glasses to people here. Just show them. The so she was like with her trembling hand and she went, um, okay, so I get, oh, there's like a little hinge here. Wait, let me get it in the light. Okay, there's like a hinge, and oh, oh, they flip right up. That is cool. So they flip like right up. Can you guys see that? And then she like froze, and a little smile crept on her face, and I was like, see? Because she did see. For, for an instant, she was involved personally as a human being as a person involved in this process of discovery of looking at how these glasses what they were how they worked and all she was doing was sort of saying what came into her mind you know i mean she was like let me angle it toward the light so it was just the most natural thing and then then she realized what she was doing oh i'm doing this in front of people and she froze but she did see. She did see the difference. She did experience it. And what we're going to experience now are questions, because I could just sit up here and talk forever. I'm so tired of myself talking. So you ask things. You can ask things, and I'll answer them. I think we have people with microphones, too, because there are some folks out there who, yes. Do I believe that self-esteem is real and is it the same as confidence? 
I gotta tell you, I have a real hard time believing that anything hyphenated is the deepest truth. <laughs> it's the deepest truth of anything. But I think the thing about self-esteem, now there's a caveat to my discussion about confidence, because that does work. Keeping your mind on what you're doing Remind, and focusing on the thing you're doing and not letting yourself, not letting yourself write the script for them. Oh, are they looking at me suck my gut in? Oh, are they looking at this? Oh, do I look too bald and shiny up here? As soon as you go down that road, you've lost confidence. So you've got to stop yourself. But this icky word, self-esteem, there are people who have deep shame. Now, and shame, it, can, can prevent a person from being themselves simply because they don't approve of themselves in a very deep way. Shame is the landfill emotion. And what I mean by that is we were not born with it and it's not organic. Shame begins as a way for adults to manage and control children. So, oh honey, Big girls like you don't draw on the wall with crayons like that. And that's effective. They feel like they don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, you just that feeling of, uh. And it continues. You know, it can continue families and coworkers, just that kind of behavior of shaming. Um, because there are no remote controls for adults, we, we try to use shame. One of the ways in which shame comes dressed is in phrases like, whatever. Whatever. Because within whatever, with an eye roll, or even no words, like if you have three people sitting and you slide your eyes to the other person, the meaning is, they know, and I know, and you don't even know. <laughs> so that's like an inherent, so shame is a thing that's deposited there. And shame is the thing that often, it's a voice that it's in your head that feels very familiar. You're not pretty enough to be a model. Well, of course you can't. Oh, you wanna be a singer? Well, that's great, if only you could sing. Shame often sounds like the voice of reason and practicality because it's so familiar that we trust it. One way to know, to be able to separate shame that's been deposited there versus you, organic just you, is that it's often accompanied by a feeling of disappointment. Oh, I love that haircut, I want that. Oh, I'm too fat. My face is too fat. So it's the thing that crushes joy. It's like the boot that grinds joy. And whenever you feel that, you can stop and think, okay, he said something about like the crushing of the joy. What, what just happened? Was something said to me? Or did something remind me of something that was said? One of the things is in order to, if you really want to fix yourself and get over certain things, you've got to be a bit of a surgeon, you know? You've got to be accurate. You've got to be really accurate with things and track them back. And that's a long answer. <laughs> yes. The important thing to learn about failure. What is the important thing to learn about failure? It's pure how not to do something, you know? How not to do something. Also, failure is, especially in our culture, we you know, are perfectionists. I think it's really essential to fail. I mean, you will always, um, you'll remember your failures more than you'll remember your straight A's, but it's how you remember the failures and what do you do with them. It's not okay to take your failures and put them in a curio cabinet 
inside your mental bedroom or li mental living room and fondle them and dust them and look at them every day. Well, I failed at that, failed at that. Oh, I remember that, failed at that. Oh boy, failed at that, divorced six times, yep. I mean, on the one hand, I could look at my life in many different topics or genres, if you will. Early on from dating to, I mean, you name it, you know, fail, 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 fail. And yet, for my brain, I did not gather them up and they were not my collection. They were, when I would encounter something new, I would be like, oh, I know exactly what not to do with you. Now, I, I, I know really friendly people like you. Bye-bye. Oh, I've done that. I know that your personality, I always try to be this to you. No. Nope. So their failure is very instructive. It's very, 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 it's the most instructive thing. It's like, um, it's, you know, rocket fuel is expensive. It really, really is. So you got to think of failure as the rocket fuel. It's just one of the costs of getting what you want or doing what you want or being what you want. You got to fail a lot. You got to be comfortable with it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to like it at all. But you can't, you know, wear it around your neck and show it off to people. It's not your, you know, it's not a precious thing. But use it. Be grateful for it. Yes. Am I sunny now? <laughs> I did. Last time I was here, I talked about a grain silo because I saw there was a missile silo on sale in Kansas. <laughs> I, well, I loved it. I like enclosed spaces, and the sun makes me itch. Um, you know what? The truth is I can really live. I could live so many places. I'm very, what's the phrase, I guess, sort of geographically agnostic. <laughs> I love many places for many reasons. But it's, and I do, I love the sun. I don't like being, I like it being out there. <laughs> but if I'm in it, everything bothers my skin. Everything in the world drives it crazy. It's in the sun too, so. Anybody else? Yes. And, uh, and so um, the, back when I was in active addiction, I used to read your book dry and I would laugh and laugh and, you know, look at this, this is hilarious. But I really didn't understand that your story was actually my story as well um, until I got there and I had to make that decision between life or death and where would I go. And I remember thinking about uh, the book dry and how it was so funny and interesting. And so when it came time for me to go to you know, to a rehab facility and save my life, uh, that's kind of what, what led me that direction. So I guess the question that I have for you is, did you realize when you were sharing your story um, in dry that it had the kind of the power to, to change people's lives in that, in that way or, or not? You just tacked a question onto the end of that compliment. <laughs> that's cheating. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. No, I did not know. And I'll tell you something. When I walk around, I've, so many people have thanked me for writing Dry and Running With Scissors and these books that I've written. Thank you for writing that thing. And I always, thank you. But it does feel a bit like I've been recognized as a celebrity, but I'm actually not that celebrity. Maybe I just resemble this person and I'm just signed it anyway. So the reason for that is because I wrote, Dry was my journal. I mean, I wrote it just because I was going to go crazy when I got out of treatment for, you know, for drinking. I was nuts. I didn't even know I was writing a book. I just was writing. And I have felt like over the years, I should write something that's like really helpful, like, like almost like a manual, you know, almost like a real manual because there's stuff that people deal with 
that like I had to get over in a, in a, in a novel way when I was really young. You'd be surprised what kind of things you have to face when you do not have any adults or any school. It's like the monkey had to learn to drive and the monkey found a way to do it, you know, that's like efficient. So I was, um, I, this is, I wrote this book to be useful and helpful. I, my goal with it was, I mean, I don't know, maybe I speak for myself, I was not chomping at the bit to hurl myself out, myself into the self-help self genre and be a self-help. That was not something I had like dreams of being. But I did have and do want um, to uh, show people things that have worked for me in terms of so they can fix themselves. People who really want to, really want to fix themselves. You know, it's, and it is all about being, learning how to be really, really, really truthful with yourself. It's like this. I have a friend who's, if you've been on a diet for a long time, 10 years, 15 years because you want to be thin, and that diet didn't work, so to get thin, you went on another diet, and it's been on and on and on. You have to ask yourself, is it that I want to be thin, or is it that I want to be the person who wants to be thin? There's a huge difference. I want to have a really cool New York City apartment. I live in New York City in a studio. That's pretty easy, right? I want to have a cool New York City apartment, but I got a microscope next to the bed and then I've got all these laptops and why hang up a shirt when you can throw it? <laughs> I get focused on things. I get like, I'll do that in a minute. I've got to get this out. I'm crazy like that, you know? And so it's kind of a mess. And I just beat myself up over it for years until I realized, you know, it's not that I want a cool apartment. It's that I wish I were the guy who wanted a cool apartment. <laughs> and that doesn't suddenly release you. It's like realizing diets fail because I don't really want to be thin. I just want to be the person who wants to be thin. How infuriating and disappointing, maybe, is that? Another thing about seeing the truth is that sometimes everyone around you says it's something else. I was in California waiting to be taken somewhere, so I had to sit in the, by the pool. I'm not like a pool guy, but I was sitting there fully dressed by the pool, waiting. And this woman walked out, and she was fat. I mean, fat as fat as fat. Boom, boom, right? <laughs> High heels, a bikini, a sarong, right? A hat. I looked at her. I swear to you, I was like, I could not recall the, the last time I had been so blown away by beauty and just sensuality and sex. Sexy, not trashy, sexy. The way she walked, this is gonna sound not as good as it was. <laughs> she walked with, it was not a haughty walk. She walked as though she actually knew it was a present for everybody and she was <laughs> really happy to give it to them. So I looked around and the guys were looking at her like, I want it, I want it, I want it. And the thin, brittle women were looking at her like, that's not possible. <laughs> but how does something like that happen? Because we all know fat people are disgusting, right? Well, what happens is that she, I don't know who she is, and I'm just, you know, putting thoughts into her, you know, life. Maybe you didn't have them, but you have to come to something like this as a conclusion. You know, you look in the mirror, like, do these jeans make me look fat? And then you realize, no, the jeans don't actually have much to do with that. <laughs> I am, I am, 
I'm not voluptuous. I am fat. <laughs> fat, yes. But I want to be sexy. Now, here's the fork in the road between the truth everyone will tell you and the thing you think is true and the actual truth. The assumed truth is, therefore, I am going on a diet right now. And I'm going to starve myself until I can fit into that size four is what I'm going to do. And then angrily work, angrily starving and eating horrible plants and awful <laughs> things. She did not do that. She looked in the mirror and saw, oh, though, I am fat, but I actually, I am the sexy too. I actually am sexy. What I need are shoes and a sarong, you know? <laughs> I gotta go shopping. I'm telling you, it's like, it's a fat that she was sexy. If you saw her walk on the stage, you'd be like, oh, I thought he was, wow. And that's because she was able to see the actual truth of her body, which was, yeah, maybe we all think people need to be skinny, but just on a gut instinct, on the, on the part of the mind that works before memory and media and what we're supposed to, it was like, the reaction I had to her was like, Whoa, not look at that heifer was whoa, whoa, beautiful. And the guys were looking, everyone was looking at this because it was true. And she saw it and she knew it. So sometimes seeing the truth is really amazing and freeing. Other times, no. Healing is a word everyone loves to throw around. Did that heal you? Do you feel healed? But heal is a television word. It makes you clap. There are some things in life from which you will not heal. If you lose it, someone you love, you don't heal from that. You end up with a hole that actually doesn't decrease in size, you know, but holes create more surface area. Holes are interesting. Later in life, you can experience the best moment of your life. In that worst moment of your life when you lost the thing you could not lose, the best moment does not squish down and make this hole smaller. It doesn't cover it up at all. What happens is the worst thing that could ever happen to you that happened, the loss that was unlosable, it's like it sits on a bench in your chest right next to the best thing. And you think you would think that it would be survival of the fittest. Well, they're going to have a duel, one of them's, but that's not what happens. What happens is you become not darker, but deeper. Both things are part of you now. I really wish someone had told me years and years and years ago, when I lost someone, I could not. It was unthinkable. I wish someone had sat me down with Boston cream pie and coffee and said, yeah, I've got to tell you, I know you're waiting to be healed and restored. I wait, you're waiting to go back to yourself because you're in this new, awful, this is you now. This is you. This is how it is now. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's like, it's like being a victim in a way. It's related. No matter if you've been a victim, many people have been assaulted in terrible, terrible, terrible ways and unspeakable, atrocious, awful. Everyone in the world would side with you and say, my God, that was, it's morally horrible and horrible in every way. But what did you get from it? What's the present? What's the gift that was tucked inside of it? Huh? If a drunk driver hit you and paralyzed you, what new great thing did you get out of it? Because you got something out of it. It's really, it's not fair and it's not fun. When you've been victimized, you feel that you are owed the world's arms around you, and you are.
but we don't get it. We don't get to have that. What you have to do, every bad thing that has happened to you or does happen to you or is happening to you now changes you. And with every change, your molecules, your building blocks are rearranged and you're new in a way. Even the worst thing, things that have happened to me were really, really expensive gifts that I, I can't say that I would give up. I can't say that I would give them up. It's very, 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 very important to take responsibility. And what does that mean? It means, so what if you didn't get into the school you wanted but your friend did? It means, if what you're doing is waiting for closure, if you just want the person who abused you to face it and to acknowledge it, and then you'll move on, no. Apologies are useless. They're pleasant. That's all they are. They're pleasant. Boy, do I know how to make a room crack up. <laughs> We've got time for a couple more questions. Yes, sir. I certainly can talk about humor as a coping mechanism. Um, when I was, uh, when my parents, when I moved into the psychiatrist's house, when I was really young, I, don't, I wasn't really like a funny, funny kid. I was pretty serious. And at 12, I was faced with such an, an overstimulating, uh, triple catastrophic, unimaginably awful environment that I was really, yeah, I had two choices, just jump out the window or look at the turkey on the wall. Why is there turkey on the wall? So I focused on what was absurd. And when things are really, really, really awful, there comes a point where you sort of think, this can't get worse, but then it does. And you think, OK. <laughs> so in that way, humor is like a life raft that you find. You're out there in the shark-infested waters of life, and this yellow inflatable raft comes by, and you hop on it. And it can float you to the next sort of safe harbor, to this next sort of solid ground. If you decide to just stay on that raft forever, um, you can end up, I mean, it's a good analogy, I suppose, basing your life on compressed air, you know? At some point, you have to really see what happened. But, you know, it's interesting, too, because to get over the past, a lot of people, I, I believed this for years, thought, well, I could go sit in the therapist's couch and talk about it again and again and again and again and again, over and over and over and over and over. But once something has transitioned from the timeline, once something has moved from now to then, in a very real and true way, it is no longer here. It is no longer real. I may have mustard stains on my jeans, but there is no hot dog anymore in the world. <laughs> the evidence of what has happened remains. The scars may remain. The dents, the dings. The... And for that reason, Closure is an illusion. You can't have closure because you can only see something from your perspective. People who feel haunted by the past, and there are a lot of people who feel haunted by the past, 
have to brace themselves, brace themselves for the truth, which is the past does not haunt us, we haunt it. When you feel haunted by the past, is it not just a little bit true that when that door opened, perhaps it was a scent that made you remember something from childhood? Is it not then true that you took a step closer to that scent? Well, what is that then? Oh, I remember my father, another step. Oh yeah, I was 12, another step. Oh, I hated the way he did that. That's how you stay in the past says the guy who's written eight books about his past. <laughs> but I don't live in the past. I recycle it now in the present into something else. If you've been abused or hurt in a way that you can't get over it, they're, they're, it's too big. If it's too big, too, too, I knew a man, or met a man, I didn't know him, I met him, who'd been in the Holocaust. And he's, he went from school to school, to college to college, place to place to speak. That was exactly the right thing to do, I think. First of all, what could he do? But recycle that for new generations of people who weren't there and didn't know, to tell it again and again and again. Some experiences are so huge that you almost have to, the equivalent of pinch my, pinching yourself to see if you're awake, you know? You've almost got to lay it out again and again and again. So maybe if you were abused or hurt or in some way traumatized, you might become a therapist that specializes in that very area and help other people. I can tell you that, you know, if, you, if you've been, a, um, if you were ever married to someone who was an abuser, if you've a battered, wife or battered husband or battered spouse. You think, well, there's not much of a gift in that. But of course there is, and you know it. The gift is that when you come across someone else who's exiting such a violent relationship, you will actually be the only person who says, anything that they can hear, that is huge. That's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. To be able to actually reach someone in the very worst moment of their life and say something that is like, oh. I mean, that, if you can, you know, that's, that's as big as it gets. It really is. And that's a gift that you have from something that seemed like only the opposite of a gift. Years ago, I was in advertising. Here's how this concept applies to advertising. I had UPS as a client. I actually, in all my years of advertising, I loved them because the CEO was like me. Well, he had more of, he had a, he had a high school degree. Maybe he didn't even finish high school, but he didn't go further than high school. And he started off, the CEO started off moving things around on the floor, you know, and forklifts and carts and stuff. So I would go and I worked at Ogilvy and Mather Worldwide. <laughs> and I worked with, um, I was the only non-Mormon in my group and I was an honorary Mormon because they loved me because I had blonde hair back then. Every single person in my group, I mean, if they all shopped at the, exactly the same place. So this is, these men wore, you know, two, $3,000 suits to every meeting. We'd go into UPS, and I would show up, dragging myself out of bed, and I'd have to think on my feet. They were going to spend tens of millions of dollars to repaint all their trucks because FedEx had just shortened their name to FedEx and made themselves purple and like, I think at the time it was like FedEx drivers, People Magazine voted them sexy or something and <laughs> UPS was brown. So I told them to do something and they didn't do it. They did it many, many decades later, but I said, what you have to do is be brown 
brown, brown. And you have to show people why they love brown. What is so great about brown? That's an example of finding the thing you hate about yourself. Well, if only I didn't do that. I wouldn't. I don't like that. All these little, you know, sort of burps. Really look at them again. Really look at them again. OK. Maybe this flaw you have is a flaw given the context of x. So you're never going to be a nanny. <laughs> what could this flaw be used for in other ways? And is it a flaw in other fields? And that's the sort of stuff that I go on about in this. And right to the minute, it is 7.15 and time to stop. Thank you, Nashville. I've had a wonderful time. I'll be out in the front.